first characteristics of Chinese case studies is that the doctor has to have done some type of follow-up with the patient. Like you have to have like called the patient a year later or asked his cousin's second uh, little brother who was married to the secretary's driver of the, of the neighbor who knew him from childhood. You have to have somehow, some way of asking, is this patient still doing well or did the disease re recur? Are they still in remission or did the disease, the disease recur? And so if you can uh, assert that the per person truly is in remission, then that's good. So they have to kind of add that at the end of every case study to add legitimacy to the result, right? So he said, follow-up was conducted up to one year after treatment that there had been no recurrence of the illness. One of the things that we see here is also the style of treatment. Like, this is a very severe case, right? He's prescribing one bag of herbs and the patient is seen the next day, right? And then he'll maybe do one an another bag of herbs and then see how, how you go. Maybe you need something different tomorrow. So the follow-up is much faster, right? And so one of the reasons why ultimately I work also with granules. One of the reasons is also because it's very difficult in Western society to have your patients come back every day, right? It's very difficult for them to do that. Like, you know, um, you, we would have to like drastically alter our uh, consultation fees for that to become possible for the patient, right? I mean, this is pra and practically, I think patients, their life is just too busy. Like, well, yeah, man, I don't have time for that. Dude, you're bleeding. But yeah, I don't. I really don't have time. You know, traffic. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean. It's like, and so, it's kind of like in in San Francisco. Oh yeah, you know, uh, I'll see you tomorrow in the clinic in Oakland. Oh no, that's impossible. I have to cross the Bay Bridge. I can't do that. You know, I'm like, uh, no, sorry, that's not possible. And I'm like, seriously, people? Or like, you know, sometimes you see like in 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 LA, like, oh, we need a practitioner in LA. Uh, you know, where are you at? Oh, I'm in Venice. I'm in Venice Beach. Um, oh no, that's not gonna work. You know, they're gonna have to drive 45 minutes. I mean, that's just not gonna work, right? So, so we have a different. You know, you can say maybe I can get them to drive once every six weeks, but I can't get them to drive every day. You know, so so we have to do it a slower approach. It's a slower approach. It's inevitably so. But you see, the strength of the medicine is way more clear in China because, like, you do these bags of bulk and people the pa picture changes much faster. Right? And that's why people, some people, they come to me and they say, hey, I want to do bulk. I'm like, great, fantastic. I'll see you in two days. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, because if you're going to do bulk, the thing is going to change fast and the follow-up is going to be have to happen a lot faster. And things, you know, when it's up or down, thumbs up or down, you, I have to be able to be there and almost micromanage it, right? So it's a lot diff more difficult. Another thing that you see is that patients, they come but they don't necessarily become like your patient for the rest of their life. It's like our patients like, oh, now they have this and you treat this for a few months and they're better. And then, then something else happened and then you treat that for a few months and then, and then something else and they just stay, you become like their personal physician almost. Like they stay in, your, in rotation in your practice and stuff like that. That doesn't really happen in China, you know. They'll have a patient who comes in for problem X, you fix it and you never see them again. And they will be all utterly grateful, but you don't, not, you know, and you never see them again. And then maybe t five years later, like they'll come in and they'll bring in their child or their sister because they remember how good a doctor you were. And now they have another serious case and then they'll bring somebody in. But it's not like, oh, I'm just going to go to my acupuncturist, you know, like that. You don't do that. I'm going to just go my, see my herbalist just for maintenance or for w my wellness. That doesn't happen. I mean, it's just never, you never saw a patient who came in, they're like, so what's your problem? I don't know, just kind of, just like, you know, um, like, I think maybe my adrenals are a little bit uh, exhausted. <laughs> and it's like, you're what? <laughs> you know, like, is that a condition? <laughs> you know, like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, okay, stick your hand down, you know. So, yeah. Um, so it was very different a style of practice, right? Case number two, also chronic aplastic anemia. A female patient, Ms. Jiang, 24, 24 years old, was diagnosed in 1983. Six months prior, the patient had experienced chest tightness, palpitation, and weight loss, had been admitted to the Air Force Hospital for treatment. Diagnoses were one, arthritis, and two, anemia. Um, results after three months of treatment were not ideal, upon which two lumbar punctures were performed to confirm bone marrow hypoplasia. This then linked with the patient's lack of peripheral blood volume, slight swelling of spleen, liver, and superficial lymph nodes, along with the phenomenon of bleeding in the dermal mucosa. Uh, a diagnosis of aplastic anemia was confirmed. Treatment was started with testosterone, stanozolol. I don't know these drugs per se, and I, you know. 
uh, I mean, I know testosterone, but securin and nitrate. I just translated it from the Chinese. These might be drugs that are no longer in use. I actually really don't know. This is Western medicine in 1983, so I think maybe things have changed. I don't know. Um, anyway, this is how the article was written. Uh, blood transfusion was given all with poor results. The blood analysis, you know, here you go, hemoglobin, red blood cells, blood platelets, blood platelets white blood cells, and so forth. Ultimately, the patient was transferred to my hospital. Anamnesis showed dizziness, ear ringing, palpitation. These are all the signs of the exhaustion, the, the taxation, the an anemia. Lack of strength, poor appetite, purpura all over four extremities. Very heavy menstrual bleeding with loss, lots of stasis clots. Urination defecation were normal. The complexion was very pale. Um, of course, the patient is anemic. Pulse was wiry, thin, rapid, very just generic yin deficiency, blood heat kind of a pulse, right? Very generic. Tongue was pale with thin white coat. I must say t Dr. Zhang looked at tongues, you know, I mean, he never really used tongue diagnosis in his guide, as a guide to prescribe, but in Sichuan there's so much damp happening within the patient, so he would look at the tongue and just because he's got him there anyway and he just looks at the tongue. I personally feel that tongue diagnosis confuses me. Um, you'd be like, oh yeah, let's use like a Jianzong tongue, and then you look at the tongue, it's like, whoa, that's a thick tongue coat, I probably shouldn't be using Jianzong tongue. You know, you start to doubt yourself, but that's not necessarily true. Just go off the pulse, it co totally could have been a Jianzong tongue, and so what, they had a thick tongue coat, it might, not inter it might not have anything to do with their pathology, and it might not interfere with the formula whatsoever. So I've ultimately, I ultimately decided to not look at the tongue, because I just don't want to be confused. I just want to have that singular lens of the pulse, right? Uh, and, you know, a little bit of backup from the abdomen because I, I feel like um, that's okay. Uh, although sometimes the abdomen still confuses me also, right? I mean, you take the, you're, you're taking the pulse, you're like, oh yeah, this is pretty clear. You check the abdomen, oh shit, shouldn't, <laughs> I shouldn't have done that because now I'm confused again, right? So, so yeah, I think pulse. I want to get better at pulse, so I focus heavily on pulse. Um, Pattern confirms to a blood impediment and deficiency taxation pattern. The indicated treatment is to break blood, move stasis, neurogen, clear heat, cool blood, and support the zheng qi, support the upright. Herbal prescription, similar structure, right? Huang qin, huang lian to cool the blood. Shan yao, bai ju to, um, to construct the spleen, but from a shen ling bai ju san, kind of like a, a slight taxation quality, right? Shui zhi, uh, mang chong, um, uh, sheng di, Bai Shao, Tao Ren, all ele elements of like the Da Huang Zhe Tong Wan. Right? I mean, Shui Zhe is not necessarily Da Huang Zhe Tong Wan, but you know, the principle of using salt blood crackers, because even at that time, herbs like uh, Qi Tao, Shu Fu, you know, all those um, other uh, Chang Lang and so forth, all those other insect blood cracking herbs were very difficult to find. You know, it's just those are medicinals that even now we complain it's hard to find. Heck, then it was hard to find, you know. And sometimes you see even times where, that, as you see here, even Suizhi and Mang Chong were unavailable in 1983 during that short period of time. So he had to prescribe the formula without the bugs, right? So um, those are all the reality of, of, of practice. So, and then um, he had some Dang Shen in this formula, right? He didn't have the Tianhua Fen, uh, but he still has the Xuan Shen in the formula. Um, yeah. Another thing maybe about the dosaging is that Dr. Zhang's dosaging was always a, a headache for me, you know. I, I'm not going to lie about it, you know. He'd be, for example, let's say, let's say you're looking at like a Bansha Xie Xin Tang, for example, right? Bansha, uh, Huang Qin, Huang Lian, Gan Jiang, Ren Chen, Da Zhao, Zhe Gan Cao, right? Something like that. So he'd be like 12 Bansha, right? He'd be like 10 Huang Qin, Five Huang Lian, right? I'm like, dude, why you go by threes and you say 12 for Ban Sha, but then instead of going nine on Huang Jin, you write 10. And then instead of writing three for Huang Lian, you write five. But then he'd be like, uh, nine, Gan Zhang. <laughs> so, from my point of view, which is like the, the academic's point of view, I'd be like, why you wanna, why? Like, he somehow, you know, he, yeah, just like you see this in TCM, you know, we've all seen this in TCM schools, like you're interning with, a, with a, one of your teachers in TCM school, and the doctor's like, oh yeah, and he writes a formula, blah, 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 these are the ingredients, and we'll do six 
of this herb and uh, let's say, well, let's do five of that one. And then uh, this one we want 10. And then uh, this herb, one. <laughs> and you're like, dude, you are so confused. Like, as, uh, you know, my opinion on dosaging is that unless it is special herbs that have like very, very specific small dosages or very specific large dosages, but the opinion is that since everything seems to go in increments of three as much as possible, it means that anything less than three, the body doesn't notice the difference. You know why? Because the pharmacist isn't strict enough when measuring. Have you seen Chinese pharmacies? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we need five bags of Bancha Xie Xin Tang. The guy wants 12, 12 grams a day. We need 60 grams of Bancha Xie Xin Tang. <laughs> That's about right. <laughs> In five bags. Just like eyeballing it, you know? They're just like, dip, 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 dip. Good, right? Oh, we need how much, you know? So it is completely inexact. It is, there, is, there is zero uh, consistency. It's completely inexact. It's totally eyeballing it. The doctors, there's some pharmacists, they're so good, they don't even freaking weigh it. They're just like, oh, uh, chai hu, uh, 24 for 5 grams, this is 24 chai hu. And they're actually really good, because you put it on a scale, it's be like, oh yeah, man, this is like 22, 22.5 grams. You know, that's pretty close. It'd be like, you know, chai hu, chai hu, chai hu, chai hu, because they're so used to it. But which it clearly proves to us, it's, it's not, that is not what it comes down to. Because also, then you're boiling it, right? Some herbs, the water didn't fully cover it. So some herbs are sitting a little bit above the water. Some herbs are like at the bottom and getting like every, every single life soaked out of them. You know what I mean? There is, it is an absolutely non-exact scientific process. Right? So going, doing this thing about, oh, I'm this herb, I want to do one gram, and this herb, I'll do three grams, and this one five, and this, this six, as far as the body is concerned, it really does not make a difference. It absolutely does not make a difference. 